Back in 1982, I uh, was a full-time farmer and uh, discovered that that was not much of a way to make a living and raise a family in, in those times. So I decided to go back to college and finish a degree and pursue a career in some other field besides agriculture. And so I went back to East Texas State University and uh, had a keen interest uh, from other activities that I pursued during those days. Had a real keen interest in politics. So I decided that uh, I'd get a, a degree in political science and I went to school there at East Texas State. Uh, made a really good uh, friend in uh, Dr. Charles Elliott who was the head of the political science department. Found that we had a lot in common, so it was easy for me to go and complete the degree, and I really enjoyed my studies there. After I, uh, after I graduated, I uh, decided that uh, since it was almost election time and that our county commissioner was going to retire, uh, my dad and a couple other folks encouraged me to run for office. And so uh, I did run for county commissioner in 1984 against uh, three other opponents. Uh, we all ran in the Democratic primary back in those days because there was no Republican primary here in Fanning County. Uh, two of my opponents were good friends of mine, uh, Billy Pinnell, that everybody knew as Popeye, and uh, Wayman Overton. Uh, and I'd known Wayman and Popeye all my life. And the third candidate uh, uh, who ran against me was a fellow named Charlie Downs who lived over south of Savoy, and I really didn't know Charlie. But we all campaigned for an office, and I worked really hard. I went door to door all across West Bond twice. I walked door to door, every door in West Bond two times during the spring, and I drove all over the precinct. and. Uh, <laughs> Visited as many folks as I could. I got dog bit twice, <laughs> which was a very interesting experience. Uh, but enjoyed campaigning, enjoyed, uh, enjoyed meeting people. And I discovered uh, in West Bonham uh, a large number of elderly folks who really wanted to talk to somebody. And so uh, I remembered what my mother always told me about being a good listener and uh, I spent a lot of time listening to folks and uh, they identified with my family. They knew uh, the Hall family here in Mulberry and I think that didn't hurt me any when I ran for office. Uh, on the day of the election, uh, Charlie Downs and I stood up on the square uh, side by side, had a long conversation all day long, handing out cards to folks, visiting with people as they came by. And by the time the election was over, he and I had become good friends, and uh, which is sort of a contrast to the way politics seems to work nowadays. And uh, But it was refreshing that we all ran for something, not against something. I was fortunate enough to win with just a little over 50% of the vote, so I didn't have to go into a runoff. Pelez Young, who was the retiring commissioner, was kind enough to uh, hired me to come to work for him on October the 1st and give me three months of, of uh, on-the-job training as the commissioner, and uh, that was a valuable experience for me. I, uh, I enjoyed my work as commissioner. I enjoyed being out in the country, and, and as silly as it sounds to some folks, I guess I enjoyed working on the roads, especially enjoyed building uh, bridges and repairing bridges and, uh, you know, that the, the big Caney Creek Bridge. Uh, I guess was the last bridge that we worked on when I was commissioner. Uh, but those were rewarding times. We experienced uh, a huge snowstorm one winter where we had snow drifts so deep that our equipment couldn't get up and down the road. Uh, we experienced big floods in 1990. I think we had uh, nine bridges washed out one morning. And so we set about rebuilding bridges and I think we had them all back in place within 30 days. So it was a uh, it was sort of a mad rush, but I had a great crew of individuals who liked to work and and uh, responded real well, and, and we just enjoyed working together. But being commissioner was, uh, was a great experience for me. It allowed me to meet people in other parts of the county that I never would have met otherwise. I've made some really good lifelong friends from those years that I spent uh, being the county commissioner. 
great people over around Ely and White Ride and uh, oh, just all across Precinct 1, some of the nicest folks ever. Pleasure Young told me when, when I started for him, he said, son, you're going to discover that most people can't see beyond their driveway. <laughs> and that their only interest is, is what's going to help them. And uh, most people are not going to understand a lot of other things. He said, but the best thing you can do if someone comes to you and, and they're aggravated and they're mad, and uh, he said the best thing you can do is invite them into your office and sit down and listen to them. And he said a lot of times, you know, you can listen to their problems and y'all can discuss a way you might fix it. Or if you can't fix it, just be honest with them. Say, you know, I can't do that, but we'll do the best we can. And that was probably the best advice I ever had uh, for being a commissioner. So I owe a lot to Pleasure Young. I had just been reelected to my third term as a county commissioner. And uh, as folks might guess, some, some aspects of being county commissioner are very stressful. Uh, and uh, I had an opportunity at that time to take a job as the chief of juvenile probation here in Fannin County. And uh, the probation officer who preceded me had cancer and had died, so there was a vacancy in the office, I don't know, for several months. And uh, I went and talked to the judges and, and made application, and they hired me. And uh, I asked Judge Doyle when I went in to, to interview with him about the job. I said, well, Judge, about how many cases a year? do you think probation, juvenile probation will handle? He said, oh, 30 or 40. And I thought, well, 30 or 40 cases, I could do that in my sleep. So uh, I went to work and soon discovered that uh, there were over 100 cases stacked up on the desk uh, that my predecessor had just been too sick to work with. And so the first year that I was in, in the uh, juvenile probation office, I handled 195 referrals and I was the entire department. I didn't have a secretary. I didn't have another officer. It was just me. And uh, I had a lot to learn. I had to go to a school down at Sam Houston State University to be uh, certified as a juvenile probation officer. Learned a lot. Those four years that I spent in juvenile probation were probably the most educational years of my life to that point. Uh, because most people believe that uh, the problems that you read about uh, with with uh, juveniles and uh, dysfunctional families and, and that sort of thing, we all believed, or I did, that those were all in the city, all in the big towns. And I discovered that it was right here in Fannin County. Uh, I did a demographic study once of the children that I handled through the juvenile probation department and discovered that... Uh, about one in four were at least one year behind in school, that about half of them uh, came from a home where drugs or alcohol were abused uh, by either one or both parents. Many of the children had alcohol problems. About one in three were physically, emotionally, or sexually abused. So those were the children that I dealt with. And, uh, so it was pretty shocking to me to discover that those problems existed right here in a little old rural Fannin County. Uh, I saw some things I could not believe. I, I one day took a young man who lived in Bonham. Uh, we were on our way to Juvenile Alternatives, which is a which was a uh, shelter in Sherman that we used to uh, house. Uh, juveniles who just needed a break away from home for a little bit and so I went with him to his house and uh, he said come on in I'm going to grab my clothes and I, want to, I want you to see where I live so I went into the house with him and we walked into a uh, a three bedroom home on West 5th Street in Bonham and uh, his mother and her boyfriend shared one bedroom his sister had the second bedroom the third bedroom was stacked with furniture that they had moved from uh, their home in Garland when they moved to Bonham. And I said, well, where do you stay? And he said, follow me. We walked down the hallway and he, he reached up and pulled down the folding stairs that went to the attic. And we climbed up into the attic and he had a mattress thrown on plywood that was thrown across the ceiling joists. 
had one little window about 18 inches square that uh, was, it didn't have a window, it was just a ventilation window. And it was hot and dirty and he had one uh, dresser up there, a chest of drawers where he kept his clothes. And he said, this is where I live. And I thought, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're living here. He had he'd gotten in trouble because he had assaulted his mother. And they'd gotten into a fight. And uh, I, uh, I think about him often that I probably would have been pretty angry myself if that's the situation that my mother had forced me to live in. Uh, uh, I don't know what's become of him in those years since then, but he and I got to be fairly close, and he made it through the probation process, through the court system, and, and got on with his life. Uh, just lots of stories about kids who just were in unbelievable circumstances, and in families that were just uh, so dysfunctional. I can remember one young man who came here from uh, down in... Uh, down near Fairfield with his folks. His dad was a 100% disabled veteran. His mother drew a disability. He had a 12-year-old sister who'd had a stroke and she drew a disability. So this was a 19, probably about 92 or three. Uh, they were drawing about 3000 or $3,500 a month in assistance and were covered by Champus VA insurance. And, uh, uh, this young man was 15 years old and in the seventh grade, and uh, he had a long criminal history. It didn't matter if I went to their house uh, at seven in the morning or seven in the evening. His dad was uh, drinking beer and probably drunk, and uh, this young man just was running wild. And uh, we finally uh, filed a petition to take his case to court, and. Uh, he had been accused of shooting a pistol at a light pole over in Bonham, took a pistol to school with him at the junior high, had stolen all sorts of stuff. Uh, we placed him on a deferred uh, placement to TYC, which meant he was on probation. If he messed up, he would go to Texas Youth Commission or the, the state uh, prison system for juveniles. Well, a couple months later, they moved over to Grayson County and had only been there maybe a month when I got a call from the uh, principal of the middle school in Whitesboro, and he asked me if I knew this young man. I said, oh, yeah, I know him. He said, well, we had him arrested this morning at the school. And he came in, and he and two or three of his buddies were in the bathroom, and he reached into his pocket and brought out a set of brass knuckles and said, I'm going to use these to whip Joe Blow or whoever. Another student overheard him, so he came to the principal and told the principal you know, what was going on. And so he said, we, we called this youngster down to the principal's office and asked him about it, and of course he denied it. No, no, I'd never do something like that. And he said, well, I don't guess you'd mind emptying your pockets onto my desk. And uh, he said this young man emptied his pockets onto the desk and those knuckles hit the desk, clang, bounced across the desk and said, that kid said, well, where'd those come from? <laughs> so, you know, he's a pretty accomplished liar. Uh, but uh, that youngster uh, obviously went off to TYC for a while. And uh, a couple years later, uh, after I had left the juvenile probation department to become the county judge, got a call from Grayson County uh, Prosecutor's Office and they were uh, trying him on a, uh, a new felony case where he and two of his friends had, had done a strong arm robbery in Sherman. So I'm sure he's had a long and illustrious uh, career in crime since then. But I often, he, he was the poster child for all the children who wind up in juvenile probation in the court system you know, here in Fannin County, alcoholic parents, uh, been neglected, uh, way behind in his education, really unsupervised. And, uh, you know, his chances for success were almost zero. On the other hand, uh, I remember a couple of youngsters who, who one in particular, who uh, lived with his mother and sister. His father was in prison, and he and his mother couldn't get along. They were scrapping 
pretty regularly and the uh, the counselor and the principal at the uh, junior high in Bonham called me and asked me if I would uh, come by and intervene and have a visit or two with him. So about once a week I'd go by the school and, and pick him up from Jimmy Alexander's shop class after school. We'd go to Brahms and get a cold drink or get ice cream and I'd take him home. We'd talk about the problems he was having uh, with his mom. And uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, he has uh, married and has a daughter and is a uh, riverboat captain pushing barges up and down the intercoastal waterway down in Louisiana, a very successful young man. He calls me about once a month. So um, there are success stories in, uh, in the juvenile world, although they are rare. Uh, but uh, made some great friends uh, while I worked in the juvenile probation department. Dr. Robin McGurk, who is a psychologist over in, uh, in Sherman, uh, was a great help to me. Uh, he used to do uh, psychological evaluations for our department on the children that I was trying to get a handle on to get a, a firm understanding of what was going on with their uh, lives. And uh, he's a great guy, and we really got to be good friends. Of course, I was uh, I was active in the juvenile system prior to being the juvenile probation. I was on the board of our regional juvenile detention center over at Perrin Air Force Base. And so I had first-hand knowledge of, of uh, what was going on there with the uh, detentions and uh, the way the systems handle uh, children. And it's a, it's a totally different system than the adult system. Uh, there's, no, there's no bail. You don't bail out of a juvenile detention facility. There are only about five grounds for which an individual could be held uh, more than 48 hours and uh, so it was up to the state to prove that that child was dangerous or didn't have supervision or was a flight risk uh, a couple other things but um, uh, it's a totally different system and I think it's appropriate for children uh, to be handled in that matter uh, rather than to be stuck in the jail cell and hope mom and dad come bail them out. Uh, I learned so much during the, the years that I worked in juvenile probation I'm thankful that I did that because it gave me a, a taste of the court system. Uh, while I was juvenile probation chief, I learned to uh, prepare court documents for, for the court, uh, to do petitions, to do orders, uh, to do all the paperwork. I, I generally would do around 30 pages of paperwork for each case that wound up going to court. Many of the cases didn't go to court. They were handled informally uh, through an informal probationary period of six months. Uh, we would uh, try to get kids involved in counseling, uh, alcohol or drug counseling or whatever counseling might have been indicated by their situation. But I learned a lot about the court system, about the prosecutor's office, about what the judge uh, needed to know and do. And so I felt pretty prepared when, when uh, Judge Doyle uh, decided that he would retire, uh, I felt pretty comfortable that having been a county commissioner for eight years and having been juvenile probation chief for four years that I was fairly well equipped uh, to be a county judge. And I was fortunate enough that the commissioners uh, appointed me uh, to fill out Judge Doyle's uh, first term. And uh, that was probably a, a good move for me. I, as I said earlier, you know, uh, working with juveniles and their families can be pretty stressful. And uh, I was on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And, um, you know, if, if uh, the police department or sheriff department apprehended the juvenile in the middle of the night, they called me and I would go and we'd either make a decision to release those individuals to their parents or take them to the detention center and prepare for a hearing. Uh, well, I met some interesting parents. I had four youngsters one day who got arrested in Bonham in a stolen vehicle. Okay. These four children are, were from uh, down in the Dallas area, and they got arrested in Bonham in a stolen vehicle. And I went over to the sheriff's department, and there all four of them sat. Of course, we had them separated, so they weren't going to be talking to each other about making up their alibi. And uh, I commenced to... Uh, contact parents and two of the individual's parents came pretty quickly and picked them up and uh, 
I sent referrals uh, on to their home county about uh, this is what's going on with them, and they were familiar with a couple. Of them. One of the one of the individuals uh, was already on probation in Dallas County, and of course they were extremely interested in apprehending him and putting him in detention. This fourth individual is a young man named Frank, and Frank uh, was typical of most of the kids that I dealt with. Apparently he came from a very chaotic uh, family life. His mother and dad were divorced. He lived with his dad and uncle, and I tried for hours to call his dad, and no one would answer the phone. And Finally, late in the day, uh, his uncle answered the phone, and I told him who I was, that I was using my probation in Fanning County and had his nephew in uh, had been apprehended and someone needed to come and pick him up and he said well his dad's not here right now and I said when do you expect him he said oh I don't know he's at the bar and uh, I finally told him I said look you know somebody's going to come pick this young man up or I'm going to call child protective services and you all can deal with them and uh, about 10 minutes Frank says well you know my mother lives nearby and I said really why haven't we already discussed this and he said because I really don't want to see her and I said, well, you need to tell me who she is and what her number is. And so he gave me her phone number. She lived here in Fannin County. So I called her, and I told her who it was. And I said, your son is here at the sheriff's office with me. He's been here most of the day. He and three others were arrested for a, a car theft. And her words to me were, well, I guess you want me to come pick the little son of a bitch up, don't you? And I said, yes, ma'am, that's exactly right. And in about 10 minutes, I hear car comes sliding into the sheriff's office and she jumps out and comes through the back door just cussing a streak. And I thought, oh my Lord, you know, what do we do here? And uh, we finally got her calmed down and and uh, she left with her son in tow. I don't know what became of that young man, but I... Uh... <laughs> he had a hard row. One, one sort of comical and funny story about juvenile probation. Uh, Bill Bristow was a good friend of mine who was chief of juvenile probation in Grayson County for 20 some years. And he had hired uh, Snapper Jones, I called him Snapper Jones. He'd worked for me a little while at juvenile probation in Bonham, but he was the, uh, he was the director at the detention center. And not long after I got to be the judge, my youngest son, had an interest in the courts and what was going on and so I decided maybe he needed to go take a look at the detention center that it might be therapeutic <laughs> and so I called uh, uh, Snapper Jones and told him hey you know this is Daryl and I'd like to bring my son over to let you give him the tour I think my son may have been 10 years old and uh, I said, I want you to make an impression on him because that's some place that I don't ever want him to be. So I drove Daryl Jr. over to the detention facility and uh, they had arranged a grand welcome for us. And uh, the biggest detention officer in the place, dressed in his military garb, met us at the door and we walked in and of course Snapper came in with the uh, detention officer and this guy's huge, muscular, black, big guy, and he walked straight up to my son. And he said, "Boy, what you doing here?" <laughs> my son said, "My my my dad brought me." <laughs> so we showed him around the place, showed him the the classroom where the kids went to class every day, uh, the uh, recreation area, the booking area where you came in and were stripped and searched and fingerprinted and the whole night you're giving your clothing. Then we took him down to one of the, the cells, or actually just a little room, uh, maybe eight by 12, and had a cinder block bed in the back end of it. And if you're really good, they would give you a little mattress about that thick and a pillow and one blanket. And uh, of course they had a stainless steel toilet with a, a fountain in the back of it. So it was, it was pretty Spartan and uh, 
they called him, you know, here's where you'd be. If you wind up over here, this is where you're going to be. And I said, you're going to like it when we lock that door because you don't have toilet paper. If you if you had to go to the bathroom, you have to get on the intercom and call and ask us for for toilet paper. And, of course, my son's eyes were as big as saucers the whole time we were there. <laughs> we stayed about 30 minutes or so. I went back and got into my truck to drive back to Bonham. And for the first three miles, I guess, after we left there, my son never said a word. <laughs> he, he sat over in the front seat, kind of had his head down. And finally, before we ever got out to Highway 82, he said, Dad, I said, what is it, son? He said, that's a very bad place. <laughs> You're right, son. <laughs> you don't ever want to be there. He said, you're right. <laughs> I don't ever want to be there. No, we never had any real trouble out of him. I think that was a pretty therapeutic experience for him. <laughs> but, I have dozens and dozens of stories to tell uh, about my work in juvenile probation. You know, one of my earliest cases uh, was a uh, transfer case in a, in a murder in Bonham, and uh, I was as green as you could come and suddenly thrust into the situation of having to do all the work necessary to prepare for a transfer case in which a juvenile offender would be transferred to the adult court uh, for trial. He'd already been transferred once and had, had gone through trial and been found guilty, but he had appealed, and he had appealed the transfer. And so we had to go back and do the transfer over again. And uh, I uh, started my reading the books to figure out what all I was going to need to do. And I thought, well, this is pretty overwhelming. So I went up to see uh, the prosecutor up in the DA's office. Carla Ball, was a, she was sort of like me. We were new at what we were doing. And I told her, I said, Carla, I know we have this transfer case to do. And I'm just going to be straight up honest with you. I said, I'm, I'm pretty much at a loss on what I really need to do to get this thing done. And she said, well, Daryl, I've never done one either. <laughs> I said, well, what are we going to do? She said, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's go down and see Judge Beard. So together we went down to see Judge Webb Beard and uh, went into the office and uh, Webb being Webb like I always was, he leaned back in his chair and put his feet up and he said, well, what's, what's on with you two? And I said, well, Judge, here's our situation. I said, we have this transfer case. And I know that I'm required to do a, a sociological study on this individual, on his, his family, his emotional, mental state, his education, all these other things. And I said, I'm really a little unsure about how they proceed in this thing and Carl said yeah and I've never done one either and I'm going to be the, the lead in this in this hearing to determine whether or not we transfer this case over to the adult side and so we're here to ask your advice uh, to let you kind of give us a little bit of guidance so we don't mess this up and Judge Beard took his feet down off the desk and he leaned up like this and he said well I've been doing defense work for 25 years, and I've never done one either. <laughs> so, well, Judge, Judge, what are we going to do? He said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to go in that courtroom, and we're going to act like we know what we're doing. <laughs> That's exactly what we did. Uh, I, was, I was probably not the most popular juvenile officer uh, in Fannin County at the time because I know that the police department was really aggravated at me because I thought this young man deserved a chance in the juvenile system for rehabilitation. But uh, uh, he was transferred and his conviction was, was then upheld and he has spent the, uh, all those years since and he's still in prison. I guess he will be uh, maybe for his life. I don't know. And, uh, but anyway, that was it was sort of comical but sort of sad too. Uh, that that's a young life that was destroyed uh, essentially over drugs and a terrible thing to happen. After my uh, after my four years of working in juvenile probation, uh, uh, as I said, it was pretty exhausting. Uh, I enjoyed what I did. It was rewarding. I have uh, I've had contact from I don't know how many of those kids that I worked with back in those days who still see me and. They want to come visit. 
some are businessmen, uh, just all walks of life. And, but they've moved on with themselves and, and are successful nowadays. And that's, that's a great feeling to know that you made a difference. Uh, but after four years of that, uh, uh, when Judge Doyle got ready to retire, and as I said earlier, you know, the commissioner's court was kind enough to uh, entrust me with the county judge's job, and so I just jumped right into the middle of that with both feet. I felt pretty comfortable, you know, having spent the previous 12 years uh, working on the commissioner's court or in the courtroom in the juvenile system. And I soon discovered that the county judge uh, in a little county like Fannin County wore many, many hats. Uh, in addition to my duties uh, with the commissioner's court and uh, helping write the county budget, uh, I also heard all the juvenile cases in Fannin County. I did uh, protective order cases. Uh, I did mental health cases, guardianship cases, uh, all the probate cases, and uh, we dispose of about 100 misdemeanor criminal cases a month. So I was a pretty busy young man. I enjoyed all of it. Uh, it was very fascinating. Uh, I, I think that we accomplished some things as a commissioner's court that we could be proud of during my time as judge. We we built the first jail in Fannin County in 50 years, uh, although it, it took a while and a lot of frustration and a lawsuit or two to get it done. Uh, we got that done. Uh, although many people are not happy about it, I played a little part in... Uh, in sort of reinvigorating the plan for a lake on Lower Bodark, uh, because I knew that not only in our future, but in the future for other communities back in uh, Collin County and in, in, in that part of the world, there would be a great demand for water. And, uh, you know, the, the Bonham Lake, I think, could provide about 3 million gallons a day at maximum. And uh, it was often tossed about, you know, that. Campbell Soup and other industries would be in Bonham nowadays if they'd ever had a water supply. And I thought, well, why aren't we working to get a water supply? So uh, I kicked that can over to North Texas and went down and met with them many times and talked about the fact that, you know, if we were going to be supportive of that project, that we had expectations that uh, the citizens of Fannin County ought to be able to uh, utilize that water resource as well. So. Although I left before that all got done, uh, I feel like that was something that uh, a lot of people hate me for, uh, but I think it was the right thing to do. Uh, I was also an integral part in, uh, in getting the uh, multipurpose complex started out west of Bonham, and, uh, which uh, one of my good friends who worked in a bank there in Bonham told me, he said, that'll never happen. It'll never happen. People in this county are not going to do that. Well. People in this county did that, and it's something we can be really, really proud of. So, you know, I was, I enjoyed my job as a judge. I really did. I met a lot of interesting people, in the courtroom especially, I met lots and lots of interesting people. You know, I told uh, an attorney there in the court one day, I said, well, every time that a misdemeanor comes before me at the bench, uh, I can't help but think, you know, that under the right set of circumstances, that could be me on that side. And so I never felt compelled to be condescending. I never felt like I needed to humiliate a defendant. I felt like, for the most part, those people were in there because they knew they'd messed up. They were there to make it right, and we were looking for an opportunity to, to allow them to make it right and get on with their life. And, you know, 90% of the people who came in uh, I said, yeah, I messed up. Let's, you know, what do we need to do? And they'd get with the DA's office and we'd work out a plea agreement. And so we handled lots and lots of cases. Uh, made some good friends in court even uh, who came in as defendants. And um, I think that probably the greatest compliment I was ever paid was by a couple of attorneys from over in Sherman who, uh, when, I, uh, when I finally resigned as a judge, who came and talked to him and said, well, Judge, we just want you to know, said, you're the finest uh, non-attorney judge we've ever worked for. And they said, we really appreciate you because you were fair. And uh, you would listen to both sides. You know, you weren't just a slam dunk for the prosecutor. Uh, you want to know the truth. And uh, I always thought you couldn't do justice without the truth. And uh, so uh, it was challenging but rewarding as well. 
And uh, people still call me judge. And people used to say, well, what do you want me to call you? I said, well, I was Daryl before I was judge. <laughs> I'll still be Daryl when I'm not judge anymore. So uh, I don't get tore up over the title. Uh, but I, I, I feel good about what we did while I was a judge. We accomplished a lot as a county. Uh, we were just in the beginning stages of what I think is going to be some exponential growth here in this county. Maybe not all good, but it's coming and there's not a lot we can do about it other than try to prepare for it and manage it as best we can. Anyway, I, uh, I, as I said earlier, I filled out Judge uh, Doyle's uh, remaining term. Then I ran uh, and got reelected. Uh, ran a, another time and got reelected. And then I decided I'd run one more time because I wanted to get to an age where I could retire. And uh, I had a good friend, uh, Steve Myers, who's an attorney there in, in Bonham at the time, who filed a run against me. And we were good friends and, uh, you know, often told people I'm not going to worry about it. I always had the feeling that if, I was supposed to be judged that that was going to happen, and if I wasn't supposed to be judged, something better would come along. And about uh, three months before the general election in November, uh, Steve dropped out. He withdrew from the from the race, and he came over to my office and uh, knocked on my door and came in sort of sheepishly, and I said, well, Steve, come on in, sit down. And he said, well, he said, I feel kind of embarrassed, and I said, well, why? He said, because I just want to come over and apologize to you. He said, if I made you have to spend money or get out and do things that you didn't necessarily want to have to do to get reelected, he said, I'm sorry. And I said, Steve, let me tell you, buddy, you were my friend beforehand, and you're still my friend now. And uh, he, uh, he took it well. <laughs> Steve was still my friend, good guy. Uh, but, you know... Uh, I think there's such a difference in politics nowadays uh, than when I first began uh, my journey as a, as a public servant. Uh, there's such a meanness and uh, uh, it's just gutter, uh, just gutter politics nowadays. And it's sort of uh, disheartening to see that people don't run for anything. They want to run against everything. And it's hard to know what people stand for. They just want to tell you what they're against. Uh, but I appreciate a good, honest uh, people who ran for office and ran an honorable campaign and uh, tried to do the right thing and never, ever had a uh, bad thought about any of it. Mm -hmm. But after uh, ten and a half years uh, of being the judge, uh, I was pretty worn out. We had accomplished a lot. And uh, we had a new auditor, and uh, I told our new auditor, uh, Scott Dyer, that I was thinking about resigning. I think he had been there about four months, maybe five months. And I said, I think I may retire. And he was in a panic. He said, oh, don't do that. And I said, well, I'm going to walk you through this budget. We're going to write this budget. You and I are going to sit down, and we're going to go over everything, and I'm going to show you how we do this. And... So you'll have a good understanding of it. And so we did. We went over it, and uh, I left him in pretty darn good shape with a budget that the commissioner's court eventually adopted. But uh, I resigned the first week in July of 2007. And uh, uh, the commissioner's court very kind to me and threw me a little party, and all the employees came. And uh, I enjoyed working with the folks. Canyon County has some of the finest employees, good, good people who are hardworking. Uh, I know it's a favorite pastime among some folks to kind of bash the county employees, being lazy and no account, but that was never my experience. Uh, they were all good folks who uh, tried to do the very best that they could. But about uh, seven weeks after I resigned uh, as the judge, uh, my friend Hal Fowler called me. And I used to talk to Hal three or four times a year. I'd go to his office and we'd talk about the court and talk about adult probation world. And I told him one time, I said, you know, if I could have my favorite job of all time, it would probably be working in the adult probation side because I wouldn't have to deal with idiot parents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he called me uh, around the 1st of August and he said, hey, I think I'm going to have an opening if you're interested. And I said, well... Yeah, I'd definitely be interested. And uh, 
So uh, in uh, September, he called me back and he said, well, you can, you can come to work for me. Well, I, uh, I couldn't actually go to work until October 1st uh, because I was, I had begun to draw my county retirement. And in order to be eligible to continue, I had to be unemployed for at least 30 calendar days. So since July didn't count, I had to go all of August and then September. We, we got things worked out and I went to work. In fact, I was so anxious to go back to work. He told me, he said, you know, how about October the 1st? I said, that's fine. And well, about the middle of September, I called Hal and I said, Hal, I want to tell you something. I'm bored to death sitting here at the house. And I said, I... Uh, if you don't mind, I think I'll come on up to your office and you can let one of your officers kind of train me on your computer system and I'll come work two weeks for free if you'll just let me come and go to work. So he said, are you sure? And I said, yeah, I'm sure. I said, I need to get something going. So he said, well, come on. So I went about the middle of September. I went on up to the probation office. Bob Hughes was one of the probation officers who worked there then. And Bob took me under his wing and he said, come on, Darrell, I'm going to show you how to work this, this uh, caseworker system that we have. And he walked me through the whole process. Of course, I had to go to school to get recertified as an adult probation officer. Uh, but I really, really liked working in the adult uh, probation department. Uh, I, I was uh, usually supervising 120 to 130 people at a time. Most of those people were from here in Fannin County. A lot of them uh, had cases from from outside the county. Uh, they'd, they'd committed an offense in some other county, but they lived here, so we'd, we'd supervise the case for them. And then occasionally we'd have folks who lived somewhere else who had committed an offense here, and we would supervise them. Uh, but it was interesting because I discovered that there aren't very many, and, and the majority of the cases that I supervised were misdemeanor cases. Uh, and I discovered that most of those people are not bad folks at all. They're people who are down on their luck or have had a hard time or they have a drug problem or an alcohol problem or they just have family problems and get overwhelmed and they do something silly. We, we handle lots and lots of DWI cases, misdemeanor drug cases, uh, you know, and, and I knew many of the defendants before they came in and uh, said, look, you know, we're here to help you make it right and uh, it was extremely rewarding work for me and uh, I enjoyed it a lot I enjoyed all the folks that I worked with we had a great staff at the probation department had when Hal retired uh, Deborah Roberts came here uh, and that was the uh, the chief at the probation department she was wonderful to work for and, you know she was one of those uh, here's the rules here's the way we do it here's what I want you to do but she didn't she didn't try to pressure us or, uh, you know, look over our shoulder every minute. She knew that we were all adults and kind of knew what we were about. And uh, she left us to do our job, and we appreciated it very, very much. And uh, uh, my last four years at the probation department were probably the, the best years of my life because I worked in Judge Butler's court exclusively. Um, didn't have to go to the district court and, and deal with Judge Blake, uh, which was a relief. Uh, so I felt very lucky that I got to deal with Charles Butler uh, every court day. And of course, Charles and I have known each other since we were six years old and one of the nicest men who ever lived. And uh, the atmosphere in his court was always one uh, that made folks comfortable. And he maintained order, but he was not... Uh, just sort of not condescending. He wasn't going to scream and holler and, and, and lecture people. You're going to talk to them in a straight way, and people appreciated that, and I did too. And uh, at the very last two years that I worked, uh, Fannie County became part of a five-county uh, veterans court program, which was a diversion court for veterans who uh, had committed sometimes felony offenses, sometimes misdemeanor offenses, but it was generally for first-time offenders or repeat offenders who had had been a long, long time since they'd been arrested. And we would uh, had a team that consisted of Judge John Roach from Collin County, who was a judge of the court. Uh, his court coordinator, of course, 
me and uh, the veteran service officer from Fannin County, uh, representatives from the prosecutor's office, uh, a local attorney who uh, was there to be an ad litem for the defendants, and uh, we had a, uh, a member from the VA, uh, social worker from the VA who was a member of the team, and we would we would review each case that uh, applied for admission into the uh, veterans court program, and we would interview the individual and essentially to we we had their criminal history in front of us already that they probably didn't know but we wanted to see are, are they going to be truthful are they going to minimize uh you know or sort of gloss over what they've uh, been accused of and uh, we had uh, i think when i left there were eight uh, defendants in the veterans court program and without exception i really became close friends with every one of those men and women who were in the program. Uh, they reported twice a month, came to the veterans court each month to see the judge and talk to him about what they'd been doing, had they been doing the counseling. We had a vast referral system uh, through the VA and, and some other agencies in which they could get drug or alcohol counseling or mental health counseling. Uh, but they were appreciative of the fact that it was a diversion court and if they completed that diversion program successfully, then their case would be dismissed. It would be expunged, and they wouldn't have a record of that offense. So they had a big incentive to do well, and most of them did well. There's always a few that were just going to do whatever they wanted to do, and they sifted out pretty quick. But that was extremely rewarding. I've been back to the Veterans Court a couple of times since I retired. and In fact, I went last summer. Uh, there was a black woman who was uh, sort of got to be like my daughter and uh, she would come in and we might talk for an hour uh, about what was going on in her life and she reminded me so much of those juveniles that I dealt with because her her mother was uh, an alcoholic and she really had no relationship with her mother whatsoever her dad sounded like a really neat guy that I wish I could have met and uh, but uh, she had been victim of uh, trauma uh, while she was in the army and she was having a hard time dealing with it and the way that she dealt with it was through alcohol and uh, so uh, but she was successful she made it through the program she was married and as far as I knew doing great and uh, so I went to see her graduate uh, and uh, that was a great day for me uh, but overall I think that uh, my work in the in the Veterans Court was extremely rewarding. I, I worked with men who were my age and men who were younger than me, some a lot younger than me, uh, some who recognized their problems and, and were working hard to deal with. There were always a few who resisted the idea that they had an alcohol problem or a drug problem or any other problem, and so they, they stayed in the program a little longer until they got it right. But, uh, it was probably the most rewarding of the programs that I dealt with in the adult probation world. And uh, it's the only reason, I guess, that, that one of the main reasons that I kind of hated to leave when I did. Uh, but I had reached that point in my life where I was old enough to draw my Social Security and uh, had uh, county retirement from my years as commissioner and judge and also had a state retirement earned from the ten and a half years that I spent, or ten years and, yeah, about ten and a half years that I spent uh, in the probation department. So, uh, in addition to having state uh, health insurance. So there I was at, at that point where I'd have two retirement checks plus my Social Security, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance in addition to my Medicare. So I felt like maybe that was the time for me to go to Mulberry and talk to my cows and think about my grandkids and my neglected wife. <laughs> and, uh, but I'd say all in all, uh, when I started off as a com uh, county commissioner uh, back in 1984, I never in my wildest dreams imagined that I would work for Fannin County for 34 years. Uh, I thought I might stay a term or two and find something else to do. And uh, the longer I stayed, the more I appreciated public service and uh, came to realize how much local government impacts 
folks around us, our neighbors, our friends, even people that we don't know that we can help. And uh, I just, I just enjoyed almost every minute of it. I laugh about it now, and I, I hope my ex-wife doesn't ever see this because she'll, she won't appreciate the humor in this. But people ask me all the time, you know, uh, especially about being judged. And why in the world did you want to leave the judge's job? That would be a cushy job. And I said, well, let me tell you, it's kind of like being married to my first wife. I said, when I first got there, I thought it was the grandest thing that had ever happened. I wanted to be there every minute. I wanted to take it all in. I couldn't stand to be away from it. And I said, <laughs> but by the time I left, I thought, what the hell were you thinking? <laughs> That's sort of the way I felt about leaving the judge's job. Uh, I didn't feel that way at all when I left the probation department. I felt like I was leaving uh, absolutely the best place I had ever worked was the adult probation office. Great comrades there, great co-workers, great boss. Uh, worked for wonderful judges and uh, just really enjoyed what I did. But uh, I knew that it was time for an old man to maybe come to Mulberry and relax a little bit. So here I am in Mulberry, uh, some days wishing I was back at work. <laughs> in fact, I tell my wife from time to time, I really need to go find a job, you know. <laughs> because I feel like every morning about 6.30 when I'm up wandering around in the house thinking, I really ought to be on my way to work somewhere. And uh, so that may happen someday, I don't know. But uh, I've enjoyed my work at Fanning County. And uh, although some people are not happy that I was all those things, I think the majority of folks that I dealt with uh, have come away with good feelings about our interactions and the things that we were able to accomplish while I was working for Fanning County. You know, I lost a lifelong friend over the lake down there. Uh, uh, and I, I just, I hate it. Uh, but uh, it reminded me what Pledge Young told me, uh, that most people can't see beyond their own driveway. You know, they can't see the bigger picture. And I think, in a large way, that, that speaks to our whole country nowadays. You know? Everybody's concerned about me, 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 and can't see how we all fit together. Uh, it's sort of a sad statement about our society nowadays. That we're all so self-centered that we just can't, we don't want to look for ways to work together anymore. And it's hard days ahead, I'm afraid.